how do you avoid procrastination and get a sense of urgency in the good sense so that you take action now? Okay, so I actually have um, a two-part answer to this question. And the first thing that I wanna talk about is the overarching reason why all of us fight this nasty thing called procrastination. And I learned about this first from an author who I so admire. His name is Stephen Pressfield, and he wrote an amazing book called The War of Art. If you haven't gotten it, you should get it. Uh, we'll do a book review on that sometime soon. Anyway, Stephen talks about this idea called the lizard brain. So this lizard brain, all it's concerned about is survival, and the lizard brain wants to keep you hidden, it wants to keep you safe. So it really stops us from, from doing things, from putting ourselves out there that could be scary, um, and it just basically makes us procrastinate. Now the thing that you have to do is just feel that fear, feel that resistance, that resistance that actually Stephen Pressfield talks about that is attributed to the lizard brain, and just keep going anyway. Um, another favorite author of mine, his name is Seth Godin. If you haven't heard of him, definitely check him out. And he says, all we need to do is ship. We need to ship our things constantly. So what does that mean? That means write your blog. That means um, produce your music. That means create your videos. You have to create some momentum so you can kind of push past that lizard brain and get your things going and get it out there. There's no secret recipe, unfortunately. There's no secret sauce to moving past it. Besides, one of my favorite things to do is called just do it. Just do it. So uh, I'll talk to you about what I do when it comes to getting over procrastination, and that's this. Tip number one, this is what I do, and it's called social accountability. So what does that mean? It means that I like to embarrass myself past procrastination. So I tell everybody and their sister about what I'm gonna do so that they can publicly, socially hold me accountable. So this way, if I tell my girlfriend, you know, I'm gonna shoot these new videos and you're gonna see them next week, if she doesn't see them, she's gonna call me out on it and I'm gonna be pretty embarrassed. So I like to use that social accountability to get me to move past procrastination and get some shit done. The second thing that I do is I schedule it. So I often like to say, if you don't schedule it, it's not real. And uh, a very wise friend of mine, and her name is Michelle Vargas, she was saying, you know, if you don't wanna schedule it, you probably don't wanna do it. And I think that that's a very good kind of inside tip for yourself, because if you're not willing to put it on the calendar, you're probably not willing to do it. So that's all I got for you when it comes to procrastination. Again, it's a nasty thing that all of us deal with, but if you pay attention to your lizard brain, I guarantee if you know it's there, you can overcome it. And then if you're anything like me, you can put some public declarations out there, get the things in your calendar, and you can move past it. I want to make a declaration about procrastination. I declare that not all forms of procrastination are created equal, and I believe that some forms of procrastination have unjustly gotten a bad rap. People are always trying to overcome it and beat it down. And the sad fact is, procrastination has gotten whipped harder than Anastasia Steele in Fifty Shades of Grey. Want proof? Here comes procrastination right now. You've been bad, bad procrastination. I'm just kidding, you're not all that bad, that's my point. Now get! Rather than beating yourself up for procrastinating, I wanna challenge you to see it from a new perspective. Here's what I mean. What if sometimes your procrastination isn't such a bad thing? What if some part of you deep down inside knows that this is your last chance to turn around before you go down shit show lane? The point where if your life were a horror movie, the audience would all be yelling at the screen saying, oh no, don't do it, don't go down there. Oh, white people. Here's an example from my own life. Four score and seven years ago. Actually, it was just last year. I was considering doing a business deal with someone. I put it on our project list and we wanted to move it ahead. Now, I surround myself with drivers, people who get things done. But for some reason, this deal was not moving ahead. We'd look at the project every day, but somehow we'd push it to the back burner and then we'd feel bad about procrastinating until... One day, I got this crazy pants phone call from that person we were supposed to do the deal with that made me see exactly why we procrastinated, even if we didn't know it yet. This person went postal over such a tiny detail that it made me wonder, how did I not catch this sooner? Ah! <laughs> 
clearly we were not meant to do business together, and thank God no contracts have been signed. In other words, thank God we procrastinated. Now, this isn't the only time that procrastination has been a blessing and not a curse. The point is that now I know if I'm procrastinating uncharacteristically, it may be a sign that something is seriously off. The bottom line is this, and yes, it's a tweetable. Sometimes putting it off is a sign you need to call it off. So I am a self-employed artist. My medium is oil paint, and I have a three and a half year old, her name's Olive. And I have a husband who has his own business, which is um, really taking off. He's about two years in, so he works a lot. And we have a dog, a cat, a house, a yard, all the things. Yes. We live in Boise, Idaho. So life's busy. Um, I create my paintings for juried fine art fairs. So I, I have to travel to those. I can only do a couple, two or three a summer given my husband's schedule. So um, anyway, my line of work takes me it keeps me in the studio painting for those shows. I also do paintings on commission. And then I have a line of my own art greeting cards. And there, I know there's potential to grow there. I have some wholesale accounts locally. Um, it's just a lot to balance, right? So right. I find it really difficult to prioritize my many, my many various life commitments and grow my art business with balance and with grace. Um, I still want to be a good mom <laughs> and be available to her. So um Anyway, I'm pretty hooked into the social media world, and I noticed that people love the hashtag hustle. I've even used it. Um, I frequently see entrepreneurs talking about bootstrapping and neglecting sleep to succeed. I don't, I don't want to suffer to succeed, and it kind of defies my spiritual beliefs. Yes. Um, and I can't really afford to neglect sleep right now and still be a present, compassionate mom to my daughter, um, who at three needs a lot of energy. She can suck the energy out of her room really fast in a good way. Um, so let me get to my point. Um, I'm really looking for a new outlook on success or maybe how to redefine it uh, at this point in my life and my career. So my question is, what are some tips for structuring my life to achieve, su achieve success with grace? And do you have some role models or a role model I can relate to? Um, that's it. Yes. Okay. So I love this question, Betsy. I think a lot of people can relate to it. First thing, and I, you've already mentioned it, but I don't know if you've clearly defined it or articulated it for yourself. The first thing you need to do mm -hmm. is define what success looks like for you at this particular stage in your life. You were talking about the fact that your daughter Olive is three, that there's a couple of different components to your business. You have the house, you have the pets, and you have a husband with a fast growing business himself. So my suggestion first and foremost is to take some time, carve out an hour or two. If you can get yourself out of the house, someplace in a different environment where you can just sit and be by yourself and really write down for you, what does success mean? I feel like it's a really nebulous term. And most of the time mm -hmm. we've adopted definitions either from our family, from society, or older versions of ourselves that may not be true to the person that we are today. So that's step number one. What does okay. success mean to you? Mm. And that might look like spending a certain amount of time with your daughter every day, making sure that you're there with her either when she wakes up or when she goes to bed. But I would encourage you to make the specifics of what success looks like and feels like as concrete as possible. None of us are ever going to be perfect as that, but I think right. that's going to give you a North Star of your own to follow. And once you have that, it's going to inform the rest of your choices. You know, I know you mentioned that you spend some time on social media and you've seen the hashtag hustle, right? Where it's like work your face yeah. off 24 seven and then basically you're dead, which by the way, I do not right. prescribe to that ideal as either. Thank you. Most people I know spend actually way too much time on social media. These things, you mm -hmm. can't see me right now, but I'm holding up my iPhone. They're designed to be addictive and social media right. sites, they are run by people whose entire job it is to keep designing and redesigning that app to get you addicted to it so you spend more and more time on their app. So it's their whole job to steal more and more of your attention and you have to set clear boundaries so that you're not in there that often. That's the other place where I feel like if people recognized how much time they actually spent on their phones or in social media, they would throw up. I did a little um, test with myself, I think it was last year where I downloaded an app that would 
calculate the amount of time I spent on my phone and I am nowhere near as bad as some folks that I know and it was disgusting right. to me. So that's the second thing I would tell you. The third thing I would, okay. I would tell you is that once you have your definition of success and you've curbed your social media or your iPhone habit, the next thing that you need to focus on is really being clear on your top priorities. At this stage in your life, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it might be true for you, being a mother might be the number one priority. Or perhaps being a, a wife may be the number one priority and maybe the business mm -hmm. comes third. And again, I'm not telling you that you need to tell us right now, but I think it's important for each of us to define what is the most important thing in our life, no matter what, what comes second, what comes third, and what mm -hmm. comes fourth. Because when push comes to shove, when people get sick, when things happen that you don't expect, you need to come mm -hmm. back to your priorities and align how you're spending your time with what you say in your heart is really most important. And then finally, I'll just tell you this, something I like to say to myself a lot, when you know what's important, it's a lot easier to ignore what's not. So that means getting practiced at selective ignorance, shutting off the TV, not opting into mm -hmm. family drama, not caring about what's going on on social media sites, allowing yourself to really remove a lot of the incoming input and information so that you can focus on only what's most important to you and not feel guilty that you're missing out on other things. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. Does any of this resonate for you? <laughs> yeah, yes, it does. Um, may, you know, maybe I'll take a hard look at my social media intake, but I'm pretty good on that front. Um, good, that's I'm, great I mean, to hear. I post on Instagram and it automatically pushes to Facebook and I don't even log into Facebook. Good so, for you. Um, and then I'm out. Um, I mean, I've got it. I think the big one for me is, is reprioritizing and really looking, taking a hard look at even my own business within the hours I'm working in the studio. I'm pretty proficient. Yes. But I get stuck in that, in that time warp where I go, Oh, what do I work on next? Do I work on the wholesale accounts? Do I paint today? And, and I know I'm losing time there. Yes. And so I think if I had my roadmap, my North star, like you mentioned, I don't have to worry about it. I, there's no question. It's like, oh yeah, here's my top priority. Work on that. Go. You just mentioned something so important. And that is a place where many of us can lose a lot of time because if we don't know what the highest value activity is, if what we really should be focused on, then we are stuck in that gray zone going like, oh, the wholesale, all the this part or the that part. And yeah. so just like yeah. for Sometimes you- Sometimes I literally turn in a circle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, this is excellent. <laughs> so just like defining success for what your life is, right? Having that definition clear for you, you definitely need to do that uh, for your business as well. Like what does success really look like and feel like? Um, this is something, I don't know. Have you done B-School yet? No, I... Ah, no, I, don't, no, I no, no, no guilty. Yes. every one of your emails. <laughs> yes, 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 no, that, that question was not about guilt. That was just about curiosity because I was gonna point you to resources yeah. in there. But at some point in the future, uh, yeah, if it looks good to you, definitely sign up because one of the gifts um, that that program brings to all the participants is helping them really prioritize what success not only looks like in the business, but how the numbers line up. So at some point in the future, if it resonates for you, come take it and that'll help you create that roadmap for your business. You share in the book one of the rules, when faced with a choice, always choose the one that pushes you the most, increases your growth, and promotes the unfoldment of your gifts, talents, and personal prowess. I agree with you on kind of running towards that which is challenging or difficult. And I feel like there's a balance. It's like for anyone listening going, you know, are you guys telling us to make everything so hard? It's like, no, there's kind of this zone, I think, where you stretch yourself and you see what you're capable of. It's not pushing it over where you get injured or you get sick or you get burnt out. but um, in your career, have you noticed that when you've taken that path towards growth, you're like, oh my goodness, look at all I can accomplish now? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think a bad day for the ego is a great day for the soul. And, you know, you were talking about people who say, well, maybe, you know, maybe I don't want to get up at 5 a.m. Yeah. It's not for me. And here's why I can't do it. And one thing I've realized is we, we become victims when we recite our excuses and we recite them so many times, we actually believe they are true. And I think you can cling to your excuses or you can go out there and have an impact and live a fulfilling life and be highly creative and, and enjoy the magic life, but you, you don't get to do both. And so 
You're right. No one's no one's saying you know burn yourself out and hurt yourself or anything like that. I think one there's a whole chapter in the Five Am Club on the essentialness of rest. I yes. believe that elite performance without deep recovery leads to depletion of all your assets of genius. So I think it's it's self awareness to know when should you rest, when should you pull back, when should you give up from a project, or when you should just continue past your limits so you can find new horizons. And that's about getting to know yourself. But I think growth comes from stretching ourselves, you know. And one thing, I mean, often we talk about physically, but in the book, I think one of the disruptive ideas are the four interior empires. And if I may, I'd just love to get into it because everyone's talking about mindset, you know, like everything is mindset, change your thinking, change your life. And I think that comes from a lot of messaging from men, candidly. And we are more than just our mindset. Because our mindset is our psychology. But a human being is mindset, and then what I call heart set, which is your emotionality, and then your health set, which is your physicality, and then your soul set, which is your spirituality. And if you really want to master yourself and honor these four interior empires so that you experience other interior other exterior empires, then it's not just mindset. It's yes, you that's only 25%. Yes, you want to work on your psychology and be a positive thinker and install the beliefs of prosperity and elite performance. But you can have a great mindset, and if you have a toxic heart set because you have pain, shame, heartbreak, anger, sorrow, then that's why you're not going to get traction around your ambitions. And so in the book, I explain how to calibrate the mindset, how to purify your heart set, and then how to optimize your health set. And then I'm going to be a little dangerous here, if I may, how to escalate your soul set. Now, people might be, you know, I know you you speak to a lot of entrepreneurs, Mm -hmm. a lot of creative people. So they might say, well, Robin, soul set isn't relevant to me. And I would, with, with, with humility and respect, say it's, It's essential to everyone because soul set is nothing mystical and it's nothing religious. Soul set is about saying, I am going to turn down the voice of my ego through my deep inner work so that the primal hero and highest part of me runs my life. Soul set is about saying, life is short. Before I know it, no matter how long I live, I'm going to be dust. How can I serve as many people as possible? Soul set is about finding a cause that is bigger than your life that you're going to donate the rest of your life to. I, I suggest to you, when you calibrate your soul set, you become a force of nature on the planet that becomes undefeatable. And yet people don't really focus on soul set. Yeah. No, it's it's a, well, I loved it in the book. And um, I actually think our audience is, is really tapped into this and they're going to love that reaffirmation of it. So you also share um, a lot of people are spending their best hours of their best days playing with their phones. And I loved this line, your phone is costing you your fortune. So let's talk about cyber zombies and distractions and the epidemic of mistakes being made at work. I thought this was really interesting. Josh, um, my man and I, we often talk about this, like just in our personal lives where just dealing with whatever it is, the cable company, you know, the kind of day-to-day stuff. And we're always like, did people always make this many mistakes? It feels like the errors in every single facet of every single industry have skyrocketed way more than I've ever noticed as an adult. So I want to, we can go wherever you want to go with this, but you were one of the first people that talked about that, the kind of epidemic of just shoddy, crappy work and mistakes that are being made. And I believe, I think as you do, a lot of it has to do with distraction and technology in our phones. For, for sure. And, and you're right. I've been, now it's very popular to talk about the addiction and uh, to technology. I've been I've been talking about it for over 10 years and one of my brain tattoos that I, I share in the book is an addiction to distraction is the death of your creative production. And we all know about the dopamine addiction that happens when you play with your phone. I mean, it, it taps into the nucleus accumbens of the brain, which is the reward center. And so every time we look for a like, every time we play with a phone, every time we respond to a notification, there's a shot of dopamine that creates a habit. And then over time, the habit turns into an addiction that is just as powerful as an addiction to cocaine. So everyone who can't break free if their technology is like a cocaine addict, they are hooked to their phone versus hooked to their projects and hooked to their values and hooked to doing something that's going to allow them to feel amazing about their lives at the end. And so 
there's this could be helpful to your to your viewers and listeners but there's a concept known as attention residue and every single time you respond to a notification every single time you look at your phone you deliver or give a piece of your priceless attention to that notification and if you do it a hundred times a day then by the end of the day you have zero focus i was in a in a a high quality hotel relatively recently and I ordered a large bottle of Evian water and I kid you not they delivered 11 bottles of Evian water. You want to talk about the mistakes being made it is stunning. There are very few people who are fully present and yet one of the traits of the great geniuses is, is this. They could spend long stretches of time in acute focus in, thinking about one project free of distraction. And then in the book, I talk about the model. It's called transient hypofrontality, which is really flow state. We yeah. all can tap into flow state where genius lives, but you don't get to do there if you're checking your phone all day long. Yeah, totally. And in terms of those mistakes, I find that in terms of economics, like what that's costing us globally, I can't even make me want to throw up. And then just when it comes to business and just being your best mm -hmm. in the world, sometimes it's like if someone actually just shows up and does what they say they were going to do, <laughs> like they show up on time, they actually fall through. I'm like, wow, they're amazing, but they've just met the bar of like what's expected. Anyway, I think there's just an opportunity for people when they bring their full presence and their heart to their work. You will be seen now, given the landscape, as extraordinary. In the 5M Club, I call it a GCA, a gargantuan competitive advantage. Yes. It, it has never been, it has never been so uncrowded at world class because so few people are doing the fundamentals yes. of world class. There yes. So few people literally sit down in, in blocks of time, create what I call a tight bubble of total focus and do real work versus fake work. And then I think you were hinting at this, but right now, I mean, there's so much lonely, loneliness on the planet. Yeah. We are we are so technologically connected and yet how how many people do you meet Marie that are so cellularly present that just by their listening or just by their being you feel safer around them it's pretty rare and i i will say one of the things that i love about team forleo i'm just going to brag on them for a minute that it's our culture here and i think mm. that's why so many of the folks that we work with are so happy at work because we actually pay attention to each other mm -hmm. and we're like really present but to to your point it's transformative in so many ways and just that ability to be here. I had a friend recently, he said, can you please tell me your secret because I don't respond to texts very quickly. And he's like, what the hell are you doing? I'm like, I literally have my phone off. Like I go check it at, you know, maybe the end of the day, but for long stretches of time, it's just not even in my eyesight. It's mm. because that's the only way I can do what I do and feel great about my life and about my work is to get that friggin' thing out of there. There's actually a piece of research that just came out and there was a dummy phone, not even a real phone, but yeah. the very physical presence of a phone that wasn't even real reduced people's cognitive ability. In other words, the very presence of a phone makes us dumber. Yes, there's this other great research um, by this woman, I actually believe she might be Canadian, Maybe not, but she was talking about how like if you're at a meal and let's just say you and I were having a meal together, yeah. if we put a phone on the table, the level of our connection is absolutely going to go down, right. you know? And so we try in our family just to make it as a practice of like, you know, even if we're expecting a call or something's happening, we're like, nope, phones cannot be in eyesight. They need to be somewhere, um, somewhere else. But thank you for sharing that. So I love this too, and we touched on it a little bit, but I want to remake the point because we live in a culture that encourages nonstop hustle. You write, we make our worst decisions and lowest choices when we're exhausted, so don't allow yourself to get exhausted. So I want to talk about the importance of taking breaks throughout the day and also time off. You know, I, uh, as the time of this recording, I know we don't necessarily air immediately, but I'm getting ready to take a nice little two-week trip to Italy. And first stop is Rome. And it has <sighs> been transformative for my business the past couple of years. I think it's, how long, guys? Maybe like five, six years now when we shut the company down two times a year. Mm -hmm. So like we, our company goes dark in the summer and in the winter for a few weeks. And it's like, 
no tweets, no posting, unless I get really inspired by taking a photograph somewhere. Um, but talk to me about how this has played out in your own life. Because you're busy, you run a business, you speak around the world. Yeah, and I smile because after this uh, interview, and thank you again for the opportunity and privilege to be with you. I know how many people that you you know you influence and elevate. Um, but I smile because after this interview, I go dark for a long time as well. And I'm in Rome, which is one of my favorite Woo! places in Rome, and I travel to other places. Um, in the 5am club, there's a model that I think is profound because you're right. We live in a world that evangelizes nonstop hustle. It's all about the hustle. If if you're not scheduled 24-7, then you're a loser and you're not doing something right. What I believe, and the research actually bears this out, the elite performers don't operate as marathoners. It's more like a sprint. The Energy Project, for example, has done some wonderful work in this field. And so I have... Uh, it, the model is basically HEC, your high excellence cycle, and your deep recovery cycle. In other words, there are periods through the day where you bring on intense fire, intense creativity, and then you pull back and recover. So one of the um, rituals in the book is the, the 60-10 method. You work for 60 minutes. It's full-on fire sprint. 10 minutes, you recover. You drink a cup of tea. You meditate. You listen to music. Then you come back with an alarm clock in front of you. Another 60 minutes of profound work, creative work, sweaty work, and then another 10 minutes of recovery. And then you do that during the week. You take two days off or three days off to refuel. And then, as you probably do as well, you take, you know, a month off or two weeks off. And so what I'm trying to suggest um, is if you're if all you're doing is being an elite performer, then you're going to actually deplete the very assets that allow you to own your game and play the long game. In the book, there's five assets of genius. It's not just, you know, your talent. I believe it's your mental focus, your physical energy, your personal willpower, your original talent, and your daily time. And so smart, creative people and the most productive people, they work really hard and then they rest without guilt yeah. and they recover and they have fun. I mean, the Japanese novelist Haruki Murakami says, when I'm not writing and enjoying life, my ideas are incubating and I'm writing my next book. Yes. I always find it's it's so fascinating. Last year, um, after an, another trip to Italy, it was when I was the most productive in writing my book. I came back and it's like stuff just poured out, right. you know. And I definitely have those deep seated um, kind of beliefs and even cultural history of like you know work ethic because that's where when you come from humble beginnings. One thing I do want to say uh, for everyone listening, because again, I have that ability to hear voice in my head. Um, Obviously, not everyone from a financial position right now where you're at may be able to take several weeks off, and that's understandable. But what we can do, I think, is model that incredibly smart practice of like, hey, work for 60 minutes and take a 10-minute break and actually take a break and get out into nature. You know what I mean? Yeah. And to and just build up. Because when you start, I think, taking better care of yourself mm -hmm. in that sense, your performance is going to go up. And then you might be able to create more pockets of time to have a vacation, even if you don't go anywhere or even jump on a plane, to be able to stay home and to be with your kids or to be with your family and to just step away from them. Even, you know, work even for three or four days can be incredibly recharging. There's a concept I teach, Marie, called the five great hours concept. You see... This, oh, 12 hour workday or eight hour workday comes from the industrial era where the more we work, the more tires we could make or more cars we could produce. But we're cognitive workers now. We're creative workers. You know, our ideas are the currency of our success right now. Five great hours is simply this. I believe that you don't need to work any more than five great hours every day because just think about it. If you knew how to set up your ecosystem, if you created what I call that tight bubble of total focus, if you worked with without your phone, if you use some of the ideas that are in the book, basically your five hours would be equivalent to most people's 12 hours or even a few days of work. And so I teach people work from eight o'clock till two o'clock and then at two o'clock, go to an art gallery, go get a massage, go get on your mountain bike. I mean, five incredibly powerful hours every day. You don't need to work any more than that. Yeah. No, it's very true. Um, I want to end with something that you write in the book, and it's something I talk about a lot. You write, tomorrow is a promise, not a fact. I often like to say we're all on the same train heading to the same destination. We just don't know when our stop is coming up. Mm. <laughs> so um, 
for anyone listening today, if they're like, you know what, I've heard so many good things, and of course we want them to get the book and to read the book and to use it, but if someone was feeling hopeful right now and there's like, Robin, what's one thing that you would share with me that could help me just make all of these changes? If you had one piece of advice, what would you share with them right now? I would say get up at 5 a.m., run the 2020-20 formula, stay with it for 66 days. Make that commitment, and after 66 days, look at how your life would looks like in terms of your productivity, happiness. And also I'd say, when I was growing up, my father who's just celebrated his 83rd birthday. Beautiful. And he's one of the great heroes of my life. And when I was growing up, Marie, he shared something from Rabindranath Tagore, the Bengali poet that I've never forgotten. And my dad used to say, son, when you were born, you cried while the world rejoiced. He said, Robin, live your life in such a way that when you die, the world cries while you rejoice. Mm. And what I mean by that is, no matter how long we get to live, like right now, everyone on the planet in a hundred years, we're going to be dust. Dust. Total okay? dust. Powder. <laughs> and, and so all the things that we think are so important, the accolades, applause, the number of likes, followers, except, you know, bikini pics or wearing the right watch, none of that matters. And I believe only two things matter on the last hour, our last day. Number one, who did you become? Were you good? Were you authentic? Did you walk towards your fears and as messy and bloody as it was, walk through them so you wear your scar tissue with pride? And number two, how many people did you serve? I believe that to lead is to serve. And I believe the highest form of a human being is doing your work and living in a way that helps other people believe in themselves and that, you know, makes the world a better place. And I would just remind people, you know, of those two ideas because I think they're very important. I love also how the book is structured. In the first part, you are really making the case, the philosophy of do less, have more. And in the second part of the book, there's these 14 bite-sized experiments that any woman or man could test for herself. So let's start with the data piece. Um, so the global research is really leaning us in this direction of doing less. Two things that I highlighted. One, in some research shared by Harvard Business Review that you quote, it was stated that very few people, including high-performing athletes, novelists, and musicians, have an ability to be in a high state of concentration for more than four to five hours a day. I find that to be true for myself. You know, I can hit it hard, and then I gotta take a break or you know do something else for a little bit because just grinding it doesn't really work. Okay. And then this was cool. In Sweden, they're moving to a standard six-hour workday, and one company found that Newsflash, if you stay off social media and minimize distractions during your workday, less work, less hours actually doesn't diminish productivity. I was like, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, if so on average, we get interrupted every 11 minutes and it takes us 25 minutes to get refocused on what we were doing. And so if it, you do the math, you realize you're spending zero minutes focused on what you're doing <laughs> um, on average. And our brain, if we don't give ourselves the break, our brain will actually um, try to get the break itself by distracting ourselves. So if, let's say, your three-year-old doesn't come in or your coworker doesn't come in to distract you, you'll open another browser tab and start a new task. You'll pick up your phone and start scrolling. You'll start a new project. You'll distract yourself. And so the advice, the experiment is, what would happen if you actually took a break at the first sign of fatigue mm -hmm. and, then, and then came back? And of course, the data shows that you're way more productive and you get more done in less time. So then you do have more time to like do whatever, I don't know, meditate or be, uh, <laughs> so lie on the ground. I don't know what you want to do, yeah. exercise. Yeah, whatever you want to do. Or <laughs> yeah. be like Kate and I and take a salsa class together, which is what we did the last time. We that, were like, you know, rather than meeting for lunch, let's just go dance, which is what we did. It was the best. It was really good. So um, the do less filter, I love this. You say, ask yourself in any area of your life, is there a way I could get the desired result here with fewer action steps or fewer elements or in less time? Curious, concrete example from how this has played out in your own life. Yeah, so in our company, we were spending some energy and time making these beautifully designed social media graphics. So it required our designer. I had to write the copy. Then the designer did it. Then I had to approve them. Then there was this whole communication process that proceeded. Then they got scheduled. It was a whole thing. Right? They were gorgeous. I mean, amazing. And we were tracking for analytics and also list growth. And they just weren't performing. So we realized, like, that's a lot of steps for getting no result on, on what we're wanting. And now I just take random pictures wherever on my phone and we use those for social and they get so much more traction and it takes me 
15 seconds as opposed to all the steps and all the money and all the time we were doing before. I think this is such an important conversation because what has, what I've observed that happens now, and I've noticed it in myself and I try really hard to catch it before I go too far down the (laughs) rabbit hole, is there is a trend or there's something new that bubbles up or people are starting to use a new platform. And then you have that little voice in your head that goes, oh, I should be doing that too. Am I going to be left behind if I don't do that too? And I'm going to go. And then you get into this kind of rat race. And I feel like that's where many of us are spending too much of our time without actually pressing the pause button, stepping back and say, A, do I even care about this? B, is it getting any results? Like, why am I doing it? And what I feel like is so genius about your book is that every corner you're asking us to slow down, pause, and ask really intelligent, wise questions to get ourselves on back, back on track. Yeah, exactly. Because if we are trying to do like six new initiatives or six new strategies at the same time just because everyone else is doing them and we saw a webinar or an Instagram ad or whatever, we don't – we're – I don't care what the strategies are. They could be completely brilliant, but you're cannibalizing on the things you were doing before that were working and then nothing will work because your your energy is like the um, the fine mist setting on your hose as opposed to the power wash setting. Yeah. So I think about like the hose all the time and, um, and really wanting to be that way. And I also want to just say that like I wrote this book because I am very easily distracted and very easily enthused. Um, so like I get so excited about new things all the time. And so I wrote this because for other people like me who have a tendency to go wide instead of go deep. Yeah. And um, I just want to like hold our toes to the fire because with the depth comes so much more success and more importantly, so much more fulfillment. I mean, for me, simplify to amplify is like I live my life by that. And the same thing, I have to remind myself of it often because – Ideas just, they're like bunnies, like popping out of my brain all the time. I got to corral this thing down. (laughs) So it is, it's wise. Hey there, real quick. If you're loving these tips, then you are going to love my free audio coaching program even more. It's called How to Get Anything You Want. And inside, you're going to learn three proven steps to turn any dream into reality. I am not kidding. You need to go download it now at marieforleo.com slash subscribe. That's marieforleo.com slash subscribe. I'll see you there. Hey, Marie, I'm 42, a wife and a mother of a 1.5-year-old and a six-year-old, and now three months pregnant. I've been working on my butt off on building my business over the last five years and struggle with work-life balance. I feel like I'm now experiencing burnout and can't seem to be productive or anywhere near it. How do I be kind enough for myself to recover if it's burnout and not feel so lazy or like I'm letting my husband and my children and my team down? My goodness. So um, I got to tell you, Cheryl, I think that this is probably one of the main reasons that I wanted to create Time Genius, to be honest with you, because I saw in myself, I saw in so many of my colleagues, I saw in so many of our incredible members of our community and our audience that people were just driving themselves into the ground. And, you know, we had surveyed our audience. I think we had over like 7,000 responses in just a few days. And I read every single one of them and you are not alone. You are so not alone. I think it's been years really since we've heard this steady drumbeat in our culture that if you're not hustling 24 seven, that you don't want it bad enough, that if you're not working for your dreams from the moment you wake up in the morning until the moment you hit your pillow, you know, your head hits the pillow at night, that you must not be ambitious enough, or you don't have big enough dreams, or you don't want world domination. And I think it's been this real sickness in our culture. There's just glorification of overwork uh, and it's dangerous. I mean, I'm not just saying that, and that's not hyperbolic. You know, 90% of all disease is either caused by or intensified by stress. That's just a fact. And I was seeing it in myself and I was like, what is going on? I don't remember ever feeling this way. And for me, I have this great perspective because I remember starting my business way back in the year like 1999, 2000. This was like well before cell phones existed. This was well before social media existed or any tool or format like this. And I was like, my gosh, I was running a coaching practice. I was like choreographing 
and teaching fitness classes and dance classes around New York city. I was also bartending and waiting tables. Like, how did I get so much done? It was like, oh, well, because there wasn't this constant pressure to create content 24 seven out of every orifice and to engage with people 24 seven nonstop, you know, again, 365 uh, days a year. And so I just want to let you know that you are not the only one that struggles with work-life balance. And for me, I see this as this complete paradigm of the world that I call time stress, which is really toxic. It's this world where you don't feel like you ever have enough time. This is world where there's constant interruptions and dings and pings and texts and, and emails, and you're constantly having to check your WhatsApp or your Instagram or your TikTok or this, that, and the other thing. And you never feel like no matter how hard you work, no matter how much you time you put in, it's just never enough. So um, the one thing is I want you to realize that you don't have to keep living that way, that there's this entirely other paradigm. It's a paradigm that I call being a time genius, where you recognize that you always have time for what's most important. And you also recognize that pushing yourself this hard, that working anywhere between eight, 10, 12 hours a day is not only dangerous, it's dysfunctional. There's diminishing returns. You're not actually being that effective. And most people, when they're sitting down to quote unquote work, they're not even really working in a focused and effective manner. They're like flittering from thing to thing. They don't know which they should focus on first. There's not really a plan. There's not deadlines. They allow interruptions and distractions, and it's just a whole shit show. So I want you to first recognize the first step in being kind to yourself is to recognize that you haven't done it wrong. You've just fallen victim to, like many of us have, the world of time stress. But I want you to be kind to yourself and recognize that that's not the only possibility out there, that it is possible to run a business and to have a family and to have time for yourself on a daily basis basis. It's going to look very different than what everyone else is doing because everyone else is running around like a friggin' chicken with their head cut off. But there is this whole other way to be that involves you putting yourself first. And that's not selfish. It involves you taking care of your soul's needs and your body's needs and, and, and what you feel is going to bring the most health and peace and creativity and joy to your life. And again, it's going to look completely different. But I think um, recovering from burnout is going to require you not just to change what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's going to require you changing your mind and your heart. It's going to require you stepping into a whole new paradigm and you're not letting anyone else down. I can tell you, I've seen people in my life in pain and I know that they've seen me in pain and I'm not letting them down. I'm actually scaring the hell out of them because they think I'm going to put myself in a hospital if I keep going that way. I guarantee that your team and your kids and your family and your husband, they want you healthy and happy. They want nothing more than to see you thriving. And you've got to be able to um, decide what matters to you first. And you have to put your own self-care first. I know that that might sound like it's impossible, but I promise you it's not. And it doesn't have to take five hours a day. It can just start in these little focused chunks. You would be shocked at how just 20 minutes, 30 minutes, first thing in your day, focusing on you and taking care of your own needs is going to have the spillover effect on every other area of your life. Again, we can walk you through all of this in Time Genius, but I want you to um, listen to what Nadia said, because she was actually someone in a position like yours when she first started uh, you know, a few short weeks ago, not weeks, it was probably months at this point, but you know, she was listening to me talk about time genius in a video just like this. And she decided to click that button at jointimegeniuscom slash enroll. And her life is completely different. So let me read you what she said. She said, before time genius, I was stuck in a place of time stress and had no idea how to get out. As a mother and entrepreneur with a full-time job, I always felt like there weren't enough hours in the day. I'm also the sole breadwinner in my family. And I felt like I was doing everything, but had no control over my life. I was having regular breakdowns and constantly overstimulated. Sound familiar? My brain used to feel like it had a constant ongoing chatter that didn't allow me to focus. Now I feel like the background noise is gone and I have so much clarity. I'm journaling every day. I'm sleeping eight hours a night. I'm able to relax without guilt. 
I thought this program would help me devote more time to my business and projects. I never anticipated it would allow me to spend more meaningful time with my daughter and husband. I feel like a new person. This program has changed my life in so many ways. Thank you for showing me how to add hours to my days, my weeks, my months, my years, and my life. Thank you, Nadia. So I say that and I share these because again, you might look at me and say, oh, well, she's got this, that, or the other thing, or she doesn't understand, blah, blah, blah. It's like, this is not about me. We've got 600 pages of everyday folks from all different walks of life, from all different stages of life who have figured out that the world of time stress is toxic. It's destructive. It's unsustainable. You cannot keep living that way. And there's this whole other way to be. And it involves you taking charge of changing you from the inside out. And I will tell you this, it happens fast. Like I've been working for over two decades, coaching and working with people. And I often will tell them like, Hey, you know, this is going to take time. You know, Building a business takes time. There's other things that you to build up a particular skill set. This takes time. All of that is still very true with this particular experience. If you give me two hours a day for five days in a row, I guarantee you, you're coming out the other side, a completely different person. And if you keep up the skills and the habits and the practices that I show you in these five days, you're looking at a completely different life. So I just want you to ask yourself right now, if you could just carve out one to two hours a day for five days for a completely new experience of life, would you do that? hands down for me, the answer, yes, every day of the week, I've done this. I've been living this for a while. So I'm completely clear and confident that it works. But for you, if you want to leave that world behind, please do come join us. So there are times for me, like, for example, we were talking off camera before we sat on set about how like earlier this particular year for me was crushing. Like there, I just got buried. There was B-School. We launched a new website. I was doing this Oprah talk. And I remember I heard the Oprah talk was great. Thank you. I'll send you a link. Um, but like my email was out of, con- I felt horrible because I care about people. And it was just like this long, you know, I'm like, oh God, somebody help me. And I'm curious to hear from you over the years, even if it's current or before, um, how you manage because you're, you're such a thoughtful person. You create so much. And as our world continues to get more connected and there's more kind of avenues in, I know you're not on Twitter and you keep comments off, so that's one thing. But even email, how do you manage to not get buried by it? And and even broader in all your projects, you know, making sure that you have the time for your creative thinking, but also for Helene and for the kids. All right, so there's boxes within boxes within boxes. Here. Yeah. So let me try to decode it a little bit. The first thing I'll say is that productivity is an economic measure of how much you output for the amount of time and resources you put in. Some people have figured out how to be naturally more productive than others per minute. And the way you do that is by having an instinct to ship, not an instinct to polish, to be perfect, to justify you're not shipping. That most people hesitate to ship, not because it's not ready, but because they're afraid. Mm. So. I I did a post about a year ago called Buzzer Management. Okay, we'll put a link to it below. That's how you win at Jeopardy. The people who win at Jeopardy aren't better than the people who lose at Jeopardy, except in one thing. They press the buzzer before anybody else. And the only way to press the buzzer before everyone else is to press the buzzer before you're sure you know the answer. So as your brain is thinking, maybe I can get it, now you press the buzzer, and in that last moment, you're going to come up with something. Right? So you agreed to do your Oprah talk. Was it done the day you agreed to do it? Oh, hell no. <laughs> so, but you pressed the buzzer. <laughs> I did. Right? Yes. You pressed the buzzer, which is going to require. So, do I have a blog post coming out tomorrow? I do. Yeah. I actually pressed the buzzer 10 years ago. So, I know that's going to happen. Yes. So, I'm apparently super productive because I'm good at buzzer management. Mm. I'm good at saying, I have this much time and there will be a thing when I'm done. Most people hesitate to do that because they're afraid. So that's the first thing I'll say. Second thing is once you've been busy pressing the buzzer, now you have to say to yourself, uh, what am I not going to do in order to be able to do that? Yes. So this is about making promises and keeping them. So I am not going to say to somebody, please go ahead, engage with me in this level, and I will get back to you because maybe I can't. I don't go to meetings. I don't watch television. So right there, I save seven hours that most people waste every single day. 
that seven hours gives me a lot of space to do things that make me seem insanely productive, <laughs> right? Yes. Because I'm not doing these other things. Well, other people really should go to meetings. Other people really should watch TV. That will make them productive in the way they seek to be productive. I'm just saying you pick. Yeah. So Twitter was easy for me because I said to myself, if I'm going to do Twitter, I should commit to it. There's a dip. And if I commit, I should figure out how to be really good at it. If I'm going to be really good at it, I'm going to have to give up something else. So what do I want to be less good at than I'm good at now so I could be good at Twitter? And I looked at what I thought would be the upsides of that. And I said, I don't want to give up anything I'm good at to be good at Twitter. Done. And I never have reconsidered it since because I don't need to. And there are other areas where I have said, you know what? I'm going to give up this part of my thing to do that thing instead. But we have to acknowledge we have finite resources, finite time, finite connections. Yes. How will we use them to produce outcomes that we're proud of? And the worst thing to do, in the words of Zig Ziglar, are to be a wandering generality. What you need to be is a meaningful specific. That means you have to claim it. You have to put yourself on the spot. You have to make a promise and say, I do this. You can count on me. That's what you're going to get from me. I love it. Okay. Any email tips from you? Because that most important email tip. Tell me. Do not send Seth Godin email. Yeah. I mean, you know that. Just don't send me email. Don't. <laughs> That's the most important. I love thing. it. Like, okay. let's just leave it right there. There you go. That's Thank perfect. You. The other thing that I was fascinated for, I wanted to ask you so bad. You probably accomplish more than most people do in, uh, I can't even, I don't even know a time frame. <laughs> and of course, you get to talk with people who are at the highest level of their game. When it comes to productivity, what do the top performers know that a lot of people just don't? What are we missing? Well, I think the best performers are focused on outcomes and not activities. If you try to manage your to-do list in the world we live in today, where most of us have multiple roles, we're trying to be a great business person, a great husband or wife, great father, great community member or whatever, there's just so many roles, you can never get all your to-dos done. And what helped me in my life was I started at one point saying, I'm not going to let myself fail every day. I'm not going to get a to-do list and I'm not going to not write a list <laughs> so that I don't fail. I need to focus on what matters most. I needed to start organize my life into categories where I say these are the most important outcomes and then I know why I'm going to do it. If you know what you really want, the target, and you know why, you have the focus and you have the fuel, then how to get there, there's so many ways to get there. And then the most important thing I think that the most productive people do is we leverage what we do. We don't delegate. Delegation is I give it to you and then when it doesn't work out, I'm pissed at you. Leverage is I empower you. If I'm leveraged, I'm still part of that. And I'm going to make sure you succeed. I'm going to follow up. I'm going to make sure before the deadline, I touch base with you. I'm going to make sure you have the resources to succeed. But what I do is empower people. Go, here's the outcome. Here's the why. I get you and I aligned with the outcome and the why. You figure out how you want to do it. I'm open. You want to brainstorm with me? I'll do it. You'll probably come up with better eyes than I do. And when you empower people to come up with their own how, hmm. and they know what and why, you can get the job done 100 times faster, especially if you get a group of people. I'm a big believer that... Early in my life, I thought I was such a smart person. I'm going to solve all this stuff. I, you know, part of it was being responsible, and part of it is ego that we all have inside ourselves if we've succeeded to a certain extent. I said, this is bullshit. You know what? Instead of one person solving 12 problems, I want 12 people to solve one problem. Mm -hmm. And I developed that practice, and I began to find that people that many people thought weren't going to contribute had insights nobody else had. I really got it from Steve Wynn. Steve Wynn's a dear friend of mine, and he's built, you know, rebuilt Las Vegas, one of those brilliant men I know, multi-billionaire. And Steve really learns the most from the bellman, from the people that would never make it into the C-suite. He learns what customers are feeling, what they're experiencing, how to have an impact, what needs to be changed, because these people are on the front lines. So I'm a big believer that you need leverage. And if you're just starting out in business, I know a lot of uh, people that are probably watching your shows are watching you because you're a successful businesswoman who's built your own entrepreneurship, you've done so many great things. Um, I think in the very beginning, the hard thing is you think you can only do it yourself and then there's only so many hours and you've got kids and family and friends and how do I do it all? The answer is you hire someone. You trade with someone. You trade them for two hours. That's what I did in the beginning. Because I, I remember, I'll never forget, I was just really young in my career, very in the early days, and I was running to the, get to the dry cleaners so I could get my only two suits because if I didn't get them, you know, then they place closes, then I can't get on the plane. And running to the airport, sweating like crazy. You know, I'm a sweater anyway. It's like <laughs> sweat, it's sweat, sweat like this, you know, trying to get in the door. And it's like, what is wrong with this picture? I could be doing something that's so productive and I'm standing in line at the dry cleaning place. And it's just nuts. And so I was really young, I was like 17, 18, 19, I don't know what else. 
I said, I'm gonna hire somebody. Two hours a day, that's what I need to start with. And then it was four hours. And so my view is I don't do anything that someone else can do better, and I don't do anything that isn't the highest and best use of my time. Now when I say that, that's gross generalization. There are things I still will do. But for the most part, by finding people and getting clear on outcomes and the why, the, what, I, what I call RPM, you gotta know the result, you gotta know the purpose, and then you gotta have a massive action plan. And the plan can change. But that RPM, the, the stronger the RPMs, the faster that car is gonna move. And I try to do that, not just through myself, but through other people. Okay, you've written freaking 19 books and you're the world's leading expert on entrepreneurial ADD. But even if someone doesn't have ADD, today's world, for all of us, that's what it feels like. Sure. So we're going to focus today on just five of your tips, and mm -hmm. all of them are amazing, mm -hmm. uh, how we can really take back control for ourselves, and if we're a smart person, how we can perform better. Mm -hmm. So I love tip number one, which is all about defining clear and specific goals. Tell us more about that. Yeah, you see, the, the problem is with modern life, the great thing is you can do so much, but the problem is you can do so much. <laughs> so it becomes critical to define what you want to do. Yeah. And what I suggest is that you every day have three goals, not more than three, because you, you can have 303 very easily. So every day have three goals, uh, short term. Then medium term, every week to two weeks have three more goals. And then longish term, uh, six months to a year, have three more goals. And then have three lifetime goals. So you're always working toward short term, medium term, long term, lifetime. And, and that forces you to prioritize. Yeah. And that makes such a difference because it, it forces you to say, well, that's good, but I really want to do that instead. You know, I, I really want to develop this idea and I'll, I'll just put that one in the hamper for now. And, and if you don't do that, you'll try to, what so many people do, you try to do everything all at once and it's just a big jumble. Yes. And at the end of the day, you say, gosh, I, I was very busy, but I really didn't accomplish much of anything. Yes. And, and we see this all the time. Smart people underperforming because they fail to prioritize and define very clear and specific goals, short-term, medium-term, long-term, and then lifetime. I love that. And you know, simplifying things down, cutting off the fat, <laughs> not Absolutely. looking at so much. It, like Even as I'm listening to you, I can be like, wow, three, I can do that. And there's like this huge weight yes. that lifts off. Yes. And I know I've worked with you before, uh, so you're incredible, but I love that's where we started. Now, number two, and I love when you talk about this, screen sucking yes. and avoiding it. Even yes. just that term, screen yes. sucking, what does that mean? It's a term that I made up when I was writing my book, Crazy Busy, and it, and it refers to the common tendency where you say, I'll just go check my email. An hour later, you're still there, you're glomped onto the screen, you're sucking away at it. <laughs> You know, the, 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 this email exerts like a hypnotic power over, over, your, over your eyeballs, and you really, you lose track of time. Yeah. You lose track of, of, of what you're not doing. You, you, you see, television is one thing, but now the screens are interactive. Yes. And when the screen becomes interactive, the same dopamine circuitry that drives addictions uh, it captures your attention. Yeah. You don't give it away. It, 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 it's, it's seduced away from you. So... Beware of screen sucking. Beware of screen sucking. And the, and the simplest way to prevent it is to have a set amount of time, 9 to 10 a.m. or whatever, where you reserve for the internet and email, and then you shut it down. T-I-O. Turn it off. Otherwise, it's like a jar of M&Ms on your desk. You'll keep reaching for it. <laughs> You know, you'll just keep reaching for it. I mean, yes. there's, there's something irresistible about an unopened message, you know. Yeah. When, or, the mail, when the mail used to become once or twice a day, we'd rush to get the mail. Yes. Now it comes once or twice a second. Yes. And, and none of us can really resist, even if we know it's going to be stupid, we can't resist rushing to that unopened message. Right. Oh, that's my phone. I'm sorry. <laughs> That was actually amazing because, of course, not only are phones ringing, right, but yeah. email, but it's yeah. like social media is there. All it's it's amazing. Everything. Nonstop. It, it's, it, it's estimated that uh, out of every hour, most people spend at least 20 minutes dealing with unplanned interruptions. Wow. And that's just a colossal waste because it's not only the time you spend dealing with the interruption, but the amount of time it takes to get back to what you had been doing to yes. reconstitute your focus, which you can't do just like that. Right. I notice that all the time and I try and, you know, I, I do my best. You know, you were asking us 
before about this actual studio and yeah. do we use it yeah. when we're not shooting? Yeah. And I was saying it's actually been amazing because yeah. we've been here some days um, when nothing's going on, we're not doing Marie TV, mm -hmm. and uh, myself and a friend, we write. Like we get here at nine o'clock, we're here until six or seven, and we write the whole day and there's no delivery guys and we're you know completely focused, there's no dog barking. It's incredible. Having no interruptions, obviously, you know, bringing back to screen I just came works. down with a, an intense case of envy. I, I, I'm a writer and I can't write more than a few hours. You can write all day. That's amazing. Well, you know what? When I have her with me, because, uh -huh. and I'm, I'm sure we'll get to somewhere there later, it's like, because both of us are keeping each other accountable. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, we go out and take mm -hmm, a walk mm -hmm. and we go get some lunch, but then we come back and we're like, let's do this. That's wonderful. Yeah. Good for you. So next tip, and this is one of my favorites, mm -hmm. which you know I have my own way of discussing it, mm -hmm. uh, but I love how you talk about it. Setting your default response from yes to... Let me get back to you on that. <laughs> Let me think about it. You yes. know, because most of us tend to be quickly very generous. Yeah. Sure, I'll do it. Sure, I'll help you. Sure, I can show up. Sure, sure, sure. And, it, and it's our great asset. But if we're not careful, it becomes our great liability because the next thing you know, we're overcommitted. Yes. Like, you know, overstretched, overbooked, and about to snap. We've said yes to too many things. Yes. They're all worthy. But... You just can't say yes to too many things. So if you simply say, let me think about that, everyone will understand that. Let me get back to you on that. Now, first of all, they'll probably forget. But if they don't forget, uh, you can say, well, I've thought about it. And honestly, I don't have time to do your excellent project justice. So you don't insult the project. You say it's a wonderful project, but I don't have time to do it justice. And they will thank you for that. You don't want to commit to something that you're going to give, you know, second-rate service to. So, so give yourself permission to at least to think about it. Or your position, get on the train to know, you know. Get yourself a first-class <laughs> ticket on the no train, Dr. Ned. That's, I know, yeah. But it's, it's really a useful way, right, to break that pattern, to yes. break that habit of yes. constantly just, yes, of course I will, yes, yes. of course I will. Yes. So yes. really yes. beautiful. Yeah. Moving on to the next one. And when I first heard you speak this one from the stage, it really hit my heart. Um, never worry alone. Yeah, you know, it, it's so simple, those three words, never worry alone can save your life, you know? And, and, and it's one of the ironies of modern life is that we are super connected electronically, but as we have connected electronically, we've been disconnecting interpersonally. Yeah. So people don't have that sense of affiliation, of belonging, of company, of uh, uh, people to turn to at hand. Yeah. There's an awful lot of unacknowledged loneliness out there. People surrounded by people, but not really connected. So have in your brain's Rolodex, the people that you can worry with about money, about relationships, about your business, you know, they're different people because you want them to have some expertise as well. As your closest personal friends, you can worry about anything with them, but you know, a financial worry, have someone you worry about that, medical worry, well, you have a doctor. I mean, and, and, and a, a three-step worry control, never worry alone. Then step two, get the facts, because toxic worry is usually rooted in wrong information or lack of information or both. So you go to the person you worry with and get the facts. And then step three, make a plan. Uh, be, be, even if the plan doesn't work, you revise the plan. Um, when you have a plan, you feel more in control and less vulnerable, which yeah. makes you more effective. Yes. So those three steps begins with never worry alone, get the facts, make a plan. But most important is never worry alone. You know, Worrying alone, the worry tends to become toxic. You awfulize, you globalize, you get paralyzed, you hunker down, you withdraw, you disconnect. When you're worrying with someone, you problem solve. You know, and, and next thing you know, you're laughing about the, it, it wasn't the worry at all. Yeah. You know, so it, it's magical, never worry alone. So our final topic for this little section mm -hmm. is cultivating lilies and getting rid of leeches. Yeah, yeah. It, you, it, lilies, by my definition, are people or projects that are worth it. Uh, they may take a lot of time. They may take a lot of effort. They may cause you all kinds of pain and agony. But in the long run, they are worth it. Cultivate lilies. In my life, my most prominent lilies are my three children. Mm -hmm. They take a ton of effort. They take a ton of concern, a ton of time and whatnot, but boy, oh boy, are they ever worth it. In order to have time for your lilies, you got to get rid of leeches. Now, leeches are people or projects that just aren't worth it. They may be worth it in their own right, but not to you. Yes. They, they don't pay back the time you put in. 
you want to get rid of those leeches. Now, some leeches you can't get rid of. If your mother is a leech, you're kind of stuck with her and you just have to live with it. You just you know, build some boundaries around it. But most of the time, you can withdraw from those leeches. People stay with leeches for two reasons, usually inertia or guilt. Mm. Well, don't do it. You know, let someone else. You, it, you don't owe it to the leech to continue to give him or her your, your precious life's blood. Let someone else do that. And who knows, that someone else may become a lily for that leech, you know? So, so, so the, 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 the downers in your life, as best you possibly can, withdraw from them so that you'll have time for the lilies. Now, one caution about lilies. People like you and, and, and most people who watch this show, your problem is you might have too many lilies. And when you have too it's a many, lily patch. exactly. And when you have too many lilies, they tend to become a little leechoid, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so, so you got to be careful not to have too many lilies. Too many worthwhile projects crowd out each other's growth, and none of them flourish. So, Absolutely. so you have to prune and cut back, and you know, have a a later group. You know, I'll get to that when I'm done with this. You know, yes. and, and so prioritizing your, your lilies, but, but, but use one of the basic principles where pe- smart people underperform is they're not using the control they actually have. They think they're less powerful than they are. And this is a good example where you can cultivate those lilies and get rid of those leeches. Yeah, I love that. And you know, it's so funny because you brought us right back around to that first tip, which was about goals, exactly. prioritizing, and bringing it down. On several of your videos, you've talked about scheduling things in your calendar to get things done. Time management has been a challenge for me for over 20 years. After lots of trial and error, I lean towards David Allen's Getting Things Done system, which focuses on maintaining things to-do lists and checking them regularly. David recommends actually avoiding scheduling items from your to-do list into the calendar to allow maximum flexibility to respond to changing and fluid situations. Now, I don't want to push you into a fight with David, as entertaining as that might be, but I would like to know, is it possible that both you and David could be right at the same time? And if so, how? Haven, since David's not here, that would sort of be an unfair fight. I mean, let's be honest. I would totally kick his ass. Round one, fight! Take this, David! I'll show you how to get things done. Hadouken! You win! But seriously, it's a great question and productivity is something that most people struggle with. Now, when it comes to David Allen's book, I have to be honest, I have never fully read Getting Things Done. So I can't really comment on his system versus mine, but I know a zillion people swear by it and it's considered a classic. But here's the thing, it doesn't matter that I haven't read the book. If something works for you, use it. Don't fix what ain't broken. And just because David and I recommend different strategies doesn't mean that we both can't be right. So just think about it in terms of fitness. Some people love CrossFit, other people swear by yoga, and other people love running. Now for me, I happen to adore workout DVDs. Press it out, good. Party back, ladies. But that doesn't make running or anything else any less effective. So to clearly answer your question, yes, both David and I can be right at the same time. Plus, there's nothing wrong with a little mixing and matching. You can go Chinese menu style on it. You can take an egg roll from David, some veggie mushu from somewhere else, and some lo mein from me. In fact, let's get some chopsticks and dig into four things really productive people, or RPPs, do every day. Number one, they're friends with time. In other words, they don't look at time as the enemy. Now, this is something I just learned from a friend, and I love it. If you set up an adversarial relationship with time, you are always going to struggle against it. And let's be honest, most of us talk smack about time all the time. It's never enough, it's always running out, we're always complaining about it, and even finding ways to kill it. Time, you sneaky piece of shit. You're always f***ing fine when I'm trying to have fun. Thanks for nothing! If you want to be an RPP, you need to pull a Mick Jagger and start saying nice things about time, such as... Time is on my side. Yes, it is. Time is on my side. Yes, it is. Now, don't dismiss this as some weird woo-woo concept. Think about it. Anytime you think of something as the enemy, it's always going to be a source of pain in your life. Number two, they make their morning routine non-negotiable. 
first of all, I think everybody should have a morning routine, a little collection of things that you do for yourself before you start interacting with the rest of the world. So for example, my morning routine involves meditation, time with Josh and Kuma, green juice, and some exercise. All these things I do set me up for success emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Now, I'm not perfect at this, so for example, if I have to catch like a 5 a.m. flight, my butt is not getting up at 2 a.m. to do all those things. I'll do whatever I can fit in, and then I'll finish the rest of my little routine later in the day. So if you wanna be an RPP, and I know you do, I'm gonna challenge you to create your own morning routine, and the most important part is make it non-negotiable. Number three, they work out. I work out. What? This is a big one. There is a ton of science that proves that exercise really optimizes your brain, your mood, and your ability to focus. Hence, optimizing your ability to get things done. Now, if you haven't read this book, you have to get it right now. It's the best book on the subject. It's called Spark by Dr. John Rady, and we'll put the links right below this video. So whenever I'm coaching someone that has a hard time focusing, one of the first questions I ask them is, are you working out? And 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer is no. So in my own personal experience, I always strive for 60 minutes, but at minimum, 30 minutes a day of just sweating my buns off. And I'll challenge you to do the same thing, because I know when I get that done, it really helps my brain focus, and I know it'll help you too. Everything is figure out. Clarity comes from engagement, not thought. Confused mind always says no. Number four, they don't blow themselves off. The biggest productivity challenge most people face is that they don't take themselves or their commitments to themselves seriously. Now, RPPs simply don't blow themselves off. They ignore invitations and emails and interruptions and anything that comes in that could possibly take them off track from their own self-imposed deadlines and obligations. They know what's important, they treat it as important, and they deal with everything else later. So if you want to be an RPP, make sweet productive love to this here tweetable. When you know what's important, it's a lot easier to ignore what's not. Hi Marie, your videos are my go-to whenever I'm having issues with something. I just watched the video where you talked about four habits of really productive people, but I'm still stumped. My schedule is never the same. I work in production and with private clients, and that means sometimes I'm on set for 4 a.m., and other times I see clients at 6 p.m. I can't seem to get a handle on morning routines and non-negotiables. My dog never gets walked at the same time. I never go to sleep at the same time. And I'll go days with no work, only to work 10, 12-hour days in a row. Because I can't set a regular routine and everything is inconsistent, is there anything else I can do to be more productive and get it all done? Thank you for making incredible videos and content all the time, Ashley. Ashley, this is a great question. My schedule is never the same either, and I travel quite a bit, so I really understand the challenges of inconsistency. That being said, there is one super simple and super powerful productivity habit that I think everybody should adopt, especially if you have an inconsistent schedule. It only takes four to five minutes every single day, and it sets you up to win huge like never before. Know what it is? Buying a lotto ticket? Bathing? Netty pot. Squatty potty. Nope, it's this. Planning your day out the night before. Oh. This is so darn simple, yet hardly anybody does it. And it's one of the most powerful things that you can do for yourself. So no matter how late at night you go, before you wrap up, just take four minutes and really think through everything that you have to get done for the next day. So here's how I usually do it. First thing I do is I open up my calendar and I take a look at all the appointments that I have for the next day and the time that those appointments will take, like this. One o'clock, I got a team call that lasts 30 minutes. 3.30, I have a Marie TV script review. That'll take about an hour. And then I have a 6.30 spin class. Then I write down all the projects and the tasks that I need to get done, and I give myself a little bit of an estimate about how long I think each project or task will take. Of course, these are estimates. Sometimes I get things done faster, and sometimes they take longer, but at least I give myself a baseline to work off of. 
9 to 10.30 a.m., I'm going to write a first draft of a sales video script. I'm going to give myself about 90 minutes. Then from 11.30 to 12.30, I'm going to review my social media schedule, give myself an hour for that. And from 2.30 to 3, I'll do a little email clear out. And finally, I make a new little section at the bottom of my notepad with personal things that I need to handle for that day. For example, get Nanny a birthday card and mail it. That'll take me about 30 minutes. Order more Kuma food, all of 10 minutes. And book a haircut for the next month, takes me about five minutes. Boom, that is it, super simple. So when I do this, it informs exactly when I need to be at my desk and working, which tells me when I need to wake up to have enough time to do my little morning routine and get everything done without feeling rushed or stressed. The worst thing you can do is wake up in the morning and go straight to your computer and open up email, and then all of a sudden you're pretending to work all day, and at the end of the day, nothing important ever got done. Nobody's perfect, and of course, not every day goes as planned, but this system gives you the best chance possible at making sure that your most important projects get done, especially if you have an inconsistent schedule. And by the way, if you haven't seen our other Marie TV about urgent versus important, you should really watch it because I think you're going to love it. So let's wrap this one up on a tweetable. If you plan on having a successful life, Start by planning your day. How great were those tips? Now look, if you are like most high achievers, something else that can hold you back, it's a thing called imposter syndrome. And that's why I want you to watch this video next. It's called How to Overcome Imposter Syndrome and Stop Feeling Like a Fraud. You're going to learn six strategies to get out of your own way starting now. According to the International Journal of Behavioral Science, a whopping 70% of us suffer from imposter syndrome or that feeling of being a total fraud. 